Well, good afternoon. My name is Jim Lisinski. I'm a Vice President of Sales here at Google. And I'd like to welcome you to the second of our ongoing series of discussions, Race at Google, a discussion, an exploration, and an ongoing dialogue about uh, racial justice, social justice, uh, diversity, and inclusion issues. We're originating to you here today from our office in Chicago, at Google Chicago, one of the epicenter cities of our country uh, where all of these issues are coming to a head and in the news and full of current events. And so it's especially important and especially poignant that we um, have this discussion originating uh, from Chicago to the rest of the Google offices and around the world here today. And so we have a, a very lively panel of VIP Blue Ribbon Group to explore these issues. I'd like to get things started by introducing your host for the day, uh, our diversity business partner leader, partner leader here at Google, Dr. Myosha McAfee. Welcome. Well, hello, Chi-Town. Um, I've only been at Google for about four months, and oddly enough, as of last week, I am no longer a diversity business partner. I am, <laughs> I am currently, I currently don't have a title, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one up, because that's Google style on some level, right? Like, we'll switch you up and we'll figure out the details later. Um, so I'm the in-house race expert. I do a lot of our strategy for race at Google. So how are we gonna be developing our skills around this? How are we gonna be developing our muscle around this? I'm gonna be in charge of creating that, the strategy for that and the programming for it. So we are now at revolutionary change, the role of the disruptor. So when I think about the word disruptor, most of us, when we applied to Google, we heard a story of this is a company of innovators. This is a, comp this is a company of disruptors, or people who are all about making change, right? So we wanted to zoom in on that particular role, that particular archetype, and think about what is the role of the disruptor in-house when we're talking about race specifically. So a topic that most of us feel a lot of anxiety about. Most of us don't have a huge, expansive knowledge around. But we're paying attention to what's happening in the world. We're paying attention after Philando, after Alton, after a whole slew of African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans that are top three groups um, killed by police officers. We're uncomfortable with killed by police officers terminology because some of us have cops as family members. Some of us grew up trusting the police. We actually experience them as folks who serve and protect the community. So it kind of created a climate internally and I think also externally and on the national stage of like how do we navigate this conversation? How do we begin to have it? And, and so part of what we want to do in the educating process is to have race series at the very beginning where we're inviting experts, people who feel comfortable having these conversations, people who feel comfortable disagreeing, people who feel comfortable stepping over that red line and getting bit or catching the blowback or whatever it is. So, they, so we thought it would be a great idea to have those people be on the stage today to kind of model for us what that looks like so we know, oh, I can actually enter this conversation and not have to worry about not waking up tomorrow. Most of us feel the fear that intensely, like, will I wake up tomorrow if I say something in this moment? And to also just bear witness to the fact that people can disagree with each other and it still be a productive dialogue, right? And I can be in the role of a disruptor. I can catch some heat from being a disruptor and still have a job tomorrow, still have colleagues who like me tomorrow, right? So that's what we wanted to model here on the stage. Um, to begin, Roland Martin is going to be our moderator. And Roland is a commentator for TV One Cable Network and host of Washington Watch with Roland Martin. You've also probably seen him on CNN, appearing on a variety of the network shows. He's also a nationally award-winning and multifaceted journalist. His latest book, The First, President Barack Obama's Road to the White House, as originally reported by Roland S. Martin, will be available outside the door. Please join me in welcoming Roland Martin. Y'all good? I'm good. In-house race expert. Oh. All y'all black questions. Let's go see her. <laughs> All right, glad to be here. Um, uh, that's a slightly old bio. Uh, I'm a host and managing editor of News One Now, which is a daily morning show on TV One, uh, and it's the first morning show uh, in history uh, for, that, that, that specifically targets African Americans with our show. Uh, we're the second largest black cable network in the country, uh, and so we deal with these topics every single day, five days a week. Uh, so I'm certainly uh, happy to be here to share this conversation uh, internally, externally, and certainly uh, when uh, we're able to stream this uh, live to folks outside of here. So let's get right to it. 
uh, introducing our panel. First up, uh, my homeboy, he decided to sell, he knew he was in Chicago, so he wore his bow tie, as in his ode to Louis Farrakhan, Nation of Islam. Uh, he probably gonna leave here with a bean pot to go back to Connecticut. Dr. Steve Perry, a national education figure. Uh, of course, many of us know him. He was a contributor on CNN when we were there together. Uh, he also uh, was the principal of Cap Capital Preparatory Magnet School in Hartford. 100% uh, of their students uh, went to uh, four-year colleges. Uh, right now, he is doing his own thing with his own uh, schools. Uh, he has one there in Bridgeport. They are opening one in Harlem. And he wants to uh, have a bunch of them all across the country. Uh, he's a little shy, so put your hands together. <laughs> And welcome, Dr. Steve Perry. Uh, sit wherever you want to sit. Don't matter. Don't matter. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Carmen Perez. Uh, you have seen her uh, television, radio, online, more than likely with her fist raised in the air. Uh, that's what she does so she can keep from punching people. Um, <laughs> she is uh, very much involved in uh, issues of social justice. Uh, and it was 11 years ago when she hooked up uh, with the great Harry Belafonte. Raise your hand, you know Harry Belafonte? <laughs> if you don't, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, and he created this group called The Gathering for Justice uh, with Carmen. And of course, uh, you may have seen her also work with the New York Justice League, one of the organizations that falls under uh, The Gathering for Justice. She's also one of the uh, founders of that. And so we want to bring up Carmen Perez. Come on, Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> she believes in branding, so you see with her Justice League NYC shirt. Yes. That's right. She's always fundraising, yes. so I'm <laughs> surprised she don't have a website on there. Yeah. Uh, David Stovall, Stovall professor uh, here at University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. Uh, he focused on several different areas, including critical race theory, uh, as well as relationship between housing and education, and also between schools and community stakeholders. He knew we were coming to Google, so he dressed up just for y'all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Jeff, Steve, and Carmen know I moderate a little bit differently. Just, everybody, I, everybody gets cracked on. All right, then. Uh, and so, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, my homeboy Jeff Johnson. Uh, we go way back. Uh, and uh, Jeff, of course, uh, has been involved in media for a number of years. You may have seen him on BET, also did commentary on the Ricky Smiley uh, show. Uh, he's filled in for me uh, on my show on TV One. Uh, and he, of course, has his uh, own company, uh, JIJ Communications. He's the managing principal uh, based out of Baltimore. And normally Jeff wearing bow ties, but he knows Google, so he's chilling. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all can check out, he got the funkiest right. socks on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to I wanna open this thing uh, this way. Uh, they gave me, and I, I appreciate it, y'all had some phenomenal notes and talking points y'all gave me. I'm using none of them. <laughs> <laughs> so just, but so I, I want to I wanna start this way because uh, I, I love to, I love to look at words. I love to look at how we frame things. This is called revolutionary change, the role of the disruptor. I want to first deal with revolutionary. What is it about that word that scares America when the revolutionary does not look white? Mm. That wasn't on the list they gave me. Huh. Go ahead, huh. huh. yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing that happens is when the revolutionary does not look white, i.e., it is not George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, or all the, whoever else we lie about it actually is going to ask a different question of the place that we live in. It's going to ask us now a deeper question of indictment, right? What has happened? And then our inability to talk about these things that are actually happening in the way that they're happening now makes it more difficult for us to even envision a revolutionary changing the conditions of the most oppressed. Let, let, me, let me dive in a little bit because I think, I think in simple terms, what's scary is the vision of the revolutionary. And so revolution is about how do you tear something down for the purpose of building something else? And what scares people about black revolutionaries has been the vision of what they want to tear down and the vision they want to create, because we're talking about power. So the fear is not necessarily about I like 
Thomas Jefferson over Nat Turner. It's what is Nat Turner attempting to tear down? And what is the vision of what needs to be created? That scares people because they inherently believe that in order for those people to have any semblance of power, I lose mine. The reason I, asked, I pose that, we'll jump in, because this is uh, James Foreman's book. James Foreman was one of the organizers of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of their leaders. And his book is titled The Making of Black Revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the greatest organizers, uh, Steve and Carmen. And what's interesting about that is that if you look at what SNCC did, the changes that took place between 1960 and 68, we credit Dr. King, we credit NAACP, National Urban League, but SNCC forced a lot of that change, Freedom Summer. Uh, we can go through uh, all the different, different uh, examples that they did, because he understood, to Jeff's point, this is about tearing something down and creating something different. I, you know, first of all, one of the things I do want to acknowledge, while I, I'm deeply humbled and honored to be here, um, the fact that there are three men up here and not more women, I think, is worth noting when we're having a conversation around disruption, especially as it relates to the African American community. The male perspective has been overstated, um, so we could all do a better job of that. So there's that. The second thing is, I think that in order for some white people to see some African Americans deciding that it's time for a revolution, they have to accept that that which they become comfortable with is in fact a problem. If more people, regardless of hue, began to look at, let's say, just Chicago and say, this is really messed up, they'd have to acknowledge that on some level they're complicit in their, in their silence. And on another level, that by maintaining the status quo, they essentially push the knife deeper into the back of the African-American community. So until such time as individuals decide that they wish to disrupt the system, they have to accept or allow themselves to be lulled into sleep that the system isn't bad and that we actually want it this way. So when we start saying, actually, I don't want it this way, I'd like it kind of like you have it where you don't worry about police officers pulling you over, or you don't have to worry, as I did when my children played in our own neighborhood, that they were going to be, um, that one of my own neighbors was going to say that they were carrying a gun and that four squad cars would come after my 11-year-old um, on the night of his 11th birthday. I'd like it like you have it, where you can have your kids play in your neighborhood without fear. When some white people begin to awaken to the depth of the reality of the pain that it is to be African American in this country, they're going to have to do something about it. They're going to have to do something about it. Carmen. And so I want everybody to put your hands out. Put them together. Right. That's easy. Now try doing it the opposite way. Right? Try doing it, where, try doing it to where it's uncomfortable. Mm. And I always tell people, if you are comfortable with seeing black and brown people oppressed, you are part of the problem. And I don't know anybody's story here. And I'm not going to say, oh, I could relate to you, and you know, we've been down this path or whatever. But I do know that when something impacts your community, you want to change it. And so we're all up, up here because there's something that happened in our lives, right? That's, I'm making assumptions now up here. Mm -hmm. But there's something that happened in our lives that told us no more. Enough is enough. Whether you grew up in a community that was plagued by violence, whether you witnessed your brother hogtied, whether you had a sister buried on your seven, whatever it was, there was something that then changed the trajectory of your life to be a change agent. And so it's the fact that when I walked down the street, I could see somebody being handcuffed and that person looks like me. It's the fact that when I walk into a prison and I walk into a detention center, the young women that I'm serving look like me. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that I could walk into Google and I don't really see anybody that looks like me. Mm. So it's a larger question about you digging deeper, going into the cavern of your heart 
and asking, what can I do? Because it shouldn't be about you feeling my pain. It should be about the fact that we all, like you said, brother, we want to be able to walk down the street. I want to be able to walk down Chicago, downtown Chicago, and not feel like I'm in a community that's genderfied because the only people that I was walking down the street that looked like me were the servers or the host, right? I want to be able to have children and tell them they could be anything, anything in the world. I want to be able to have the type of lifestyle that I've seen around other colleagues, right? That's all I want. And so I work hard every single day. And I'm involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. And people are like, well, you're Latina. Why do you care? And I'm like, because I had black teachers. I had black coaches. And I had black pastors. And once, right, I've traveled the world. I've been to Cuba. I've been to all these places. And I've seen that black people are oppressed all over the world. Mm -hmm. You don't need to come to a race conversation to see that. You see it every single day when you turn, turn on CNN or you turn on Fox, whatever people prefer. You see it every single day, right? And so I know that once black people are free, my people are free. The thing I think is interesting when you talk about seeing, uh, I lived and worked in Chicago for six years. Uh, and what many of you in here in this room, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, doesn't matter who you are, you may not realize that in this city, when they had the tourist maps of Chicago, mm -hmm. it did not extend past 22nd Street. Trust. It didn't go into Bronzeville. Mm -hmm. It didn't go, it did not literally go past 22nd Street. Mm -hmm. So what that said in Chicago, if you come to Chicago, we only want you to go from here to here. And it's amazing how a lot of people have, again, don't have the context to understand a city like this here. Jeff, I want you to speak to this. Also, having to understand the history, I don't want to use Chicago as the example. Harold Washington runs for mayor, 1983, and the racial hatred that existed that a sitting member of Congress who's black would dare run to be mayor of a city with <laughs> the second largest concentration of black people outside the continent of Africa. Mm. So what's the question? <laughs> the question is, I want you to speak, speak to that experience and how folks who might live here present day doesn't realize that, oh yeah, that was 1983, but it still lives and permeates the city and its structure today. Well, I, I think, one, any time marginalized people have the gumption to lead, not just those that are marginalized, but everybody, it, there are two things that happens. Number one, it says, oh, my God, we don't want them con in control of purse strings. Mm -hmm. And so, again, because it becomes, and let's, and let's be honest, because I, th I think that there's there, when we have this race conversation, a lot of times we have it through the lens of we as marginalized people are only talking to white people. Mm -hmm. There's multi-level conversations that need to be happening here. And so, even when we have these conversations about black political power, black political power has never been about black political positions. And so when you think about what happened in Chicago, similar to what happened in Atlanta, similar to what happened in D.C., these mayors were powerful not just because they were black and they were able to get control of City Hall. They were powerful because they shifted the very resources of a city to create black millionaires, to create opportunity, to create power. And while they didn't give it to everybody, let's be clear, everybody didn't get it, there was a shift of power that scared people. And so whether it was Maynard Jackson in Atlanta or whether it was Marion Barry in Washington, D.C., or whether it was the first black mayor in Cleveland, Ohio with Carl Stokes, the, the fear was not just about the gumption of thinking that you could have power. It was what ultimately happens when this individual has the ability to shift wealth and to shift resources and to shift what communities look like. And to Carmen's point, the, the real challenge is because so many of these cities have been designed with disenfranchisement in mind, 
Folks that were never part of those other communities have never been able to see the inherent value in broad-based economic development. So I live in a city like Baltimore th that I think is, has had decades of intentional lack of development in certain parts of the city that are primarily black and poor white. And Baltimore has billions of dollars in development. The harbor looks fantastic. The communities that, <laughs> that extend from the harbor look amazing. People come to Baltimore and they love it. They get to go down to the water. They get to get some crabs. They have a great time at hotels. They shop. But you have block upon block upon block upon block upon block of some of the worst blight in America. And not under one mayor or two mayors or three mayors or four mayors of 10 mayors. That doesn't happen by accident. And so the challenge is for those black those, those people of color or marginalized people that get into power, the disruption comes in are you willing, the disruption is not you being elected. Mm -hmm. The disruption is do you do something different when you're there to shift power in a way that creates disruption versus you giving the appearance of disruption by you being the first, second, or third person of color that's in this position. And that's why I wanted to go to Jeff because I want, and anyone could jump in on this mm -hmm. one, because when we talk about revolution, and disruption, what we are facing right now in 2016, this is a battle over power. Mm -hmm. And this is a generation that has seen this post-civil rights, they saw integration, they saw Dr. King, Van Lou Hamer, they saw so many others, and they said, no, we don't want equality, we want power. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of go back to what you were saying in regards to SNCC, right? They organized, they were able to accomplish so many victories. And, but when you look at the victory, right, gaining the opportunity to integrate, you were integrating what Mr. Balafonte talks about, that doc, his last conversation with a Dr. King house. was, they were integrating into a burning house. So Dr. King then says, so then what do we become? And he says, firemen. But at the end of the day, you're integrating institutions that were racist, right? So nobody woke up the next day and said, hey, we're welcoming black children into our schools. Look at the, how, what happened with the Little Rock Nine. And, and so for me, I always ask Mr. Balafonte, what was the integration plan? Right? So you made the assumption that there was no more racism in America after that went away, right? However, there was no real integration plan, and these institutions are still. But racist. that was never the plan. Yeah. Right. The plan was no, no, no. But but I think there's a misnomer when we talk about civil rights and social justice of the '60s. The plan was never integration; it was desegregation. Right. And so there was this myth that it was about black folks and white folks and poor people and wealthy people holding hands and singing kumbaya and all feeling good about living in the same community, when it was really about how do you dismantle policy and legislation that prevents people from maximizing access to the resources that give them the, the, the ability to have the pursuit of happiness. But, but this narrative about that integration piece, I think, has persisted because it allows other generations to say, wait a minute, it was never supposed to be about power for you. It was supposed to be about you being able to get along mm -hmm. in spaces of other people's power. And when you're allowed to have that integration narrative that continues, the marginalized always feel comfortable being marginalized, and white supremacy is able to persist mm -hmm. because it gives white folks the, 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 the gumption to believe, wait a minute, integration was always about these people coming and being a part of what we created and gave them access to. Hell no, that's not what it's about. It was about desegregation to change policies and access to the very resources that create power, and that's scary. Not just, and, and I'm sorry, not just to <laughs> white folks. There are black folks that were scared of that mm -hmm. because of how they had been he, conditioned. He feels scared. Right. And, and because of how they had been conditioned. But, but, but I just, and, and I'm not disagreeing with Carmen, mm -hmm. I'm saying that the narrative yeah. of integration has persisted as the goal of what civil rights was about, and that was never the goal. Mm -hmm. in, in the space within which I work, which is education, I often find myself fighting people to get them to understand that African American children are as bright as any other children on earth. They were born no differently, no different process to make them. They all happened the same way. The difference is that when we come out into a system that was not designed to support our overall growth, we fall short of the beauty that we have inside of us. And so when Jeff is talking about the disruption of systems, what that for me means is a disruption of a system that educates children or sends children to schools that are closest to their house. 
houses that were, addresses that were determined by keeping certain people away from other people, by systems that were determined to ensure that those children who live in that neighborhood will never gain the same access, the same access to the quality of, of education that's required to participate fully in the economy, to know to read, to know to write, to, to have the basic self-esteem to be able to sit in a room. Many of my kids won't, answer, won't ask a question for fear that they will think that someone thinks that they're stupid. It's breaking down those barriers. Or, worse still, that they will answer those questions and people will call them white. In either case, they will somehow be chastised for exploring the beauty that's inside them. But this system that is put in place is not just some esoteric notion of systems that we often get caught up in, but it's an actual set of principles that ensures that that which occurred in Baltimore will continue to occur over and over and over again, regardless of the color of the person that you put in place until such time as people of all colors get sick and tired of it and say, man, this just can't be America. We can't be this place that promises a child failure for the rest of their life, uh, imprisons them for failing if they only just did what they were supposed to do, which is to go to the school that was never going to educate them, and, and blame the parents and anyone else, and stops those individuals who seek, who seek to give them freedom. I'll say the final part here. The most revolutionary thing you can do, Brother Roland, is teach people who were never supposed to be taught, hmm. to show them that there is nothing wrong with them, to show them that they are beautiful and capable, to give them the access to the wisdom, because the root of every revolution is education. And it is why it was one of the laws on the slave books that said very clearly it was punishable by death. Teach a slave to read, and we will kill your ass. Mm. Right. And it's just, this, there's, a, there's okay. a part here that I think we want to kick this up a little bit because I appreciate everybody's <laughs> point. And it's staying around looking at desegregation, integration, and what you talk about power. We should kick that up a bit because what Go we're ahead. really talking about is equity, right? right? But there's a piece in equity. Equity says that some people who have been further disenfranchised might need more. And this, herein lies the problem. Because remember, when Harold Washington was elected, after 1987, they changed the voting laws. Yes. Right? So here in Chicago, to win a mayoral election, you have to win 50% plus one. Well, the previous law was whoever gets the top vote Votes getter. So wins. when he ran, there were three people, him, Jane Byrne, the incumbent, and Richard Daly, yeah. who was state's attorney. Mm -hmm. He comes in first. Then a Democrat runs as a Republican in November. Mm -hmm. Washington barely wins because it was white, black. But yes, the moment he died, they changed the law and said, we will not have this repeat mm -hmm. itself, and you have not had a black mayor in Chicago since. And you have not had voter registration or voter turnout over 35%, right? So now, if we think about that particular relationship, Harold Washington was clear and he was pragmatic in it. He talked about equity, right? So Harold Washington was one of the first folks to talk about affordable housing. Right? So Harold Washington had on the books, if there was any unit built over six units, right? So that's a, any apartment building that had over six apartments in it, three of them had to be affordable housing, right? So now we're struggling in Chicago for affordable housing legislation at 20%, right? So now, in thinking about this equity, equity is saying, no, you need what you need when you need it. That might mean that folks who have historically been disenfranchised might need a little more in the larger equation. Mm -hmm. And herein lies the question of power. That's why random dude with the comb over can talk all this crazy shit, <laughs> right? That's why, he, that's why he can say these things, because he can get folks to believe that you now have lost something that you never really had. You vote against your own interest because if these folks get in power, this is going to happen. Remember the advertisements with Harold Washington when Bernard Epton ran against him? It was Bernard Epton or else. Right. Right? Donald Trump has stood in front of folks and said, look, you better rock with me or else. Mm -hmm. Right? They coming for you. Right? This garbage last week. Huh? What do you have to lose? 58% of your folks are in poverty. And whatever Bozini was talking about, and then said, look, give me your chance. What? 
Right, because this thing around now, we have to be able to ask a deeper question because on top of equity, we also need to understand that everybody talked about this, white supremacy is not a group of white extremists calling people the N-word or lynching folks. Right. White supremacy is the understood views and values of Western European descended, able-bodied, heterosexual Christian, Christian men as normal, right, and good. Everyone else is deserving of gratuitous punishment until they acquiesce to those purported views and values. Interesting, Steve, uh, you made a point that I want to come back. When you talked about it, in the law, slaves couldn't read. Because I, when I hear people say, can y'all just call it Black Lives Matter 2? <laughs> can you just put the two <laughs> on the end so I, I feel comfortable. <laughs> and as you were talking, <laughs> straight up, that's real. Uh, as you were talking, I began to think about the fact, and then when Carmen said, being Latina involved in this movement. If you actually look at American history, not his story, some of y'all gonna kiss that when you get it. To your <laughs> Black folks, have always tried to force America to live up to its written ideals. There's a white woman sitting here right now that denies the reality that they have benefited from affirmative action more than anybody else. Title IX is talked about as being about sports, when in fact, Title IX was about opening the professional schools to be professors, doctors, dentists, lawyers. Title IX is a provision of the Civil Rights Act, 1964. Anybody here disabled? Anybody here disabled? The American with Disabilities Act is a provision of the Civil Rights Act. If you are Vietnamese and you go vote, your ballot is in Vietnamese. That's because of the Voting Rights Act, 1965. If you are gay and lesbian and you're excited you can now get married, the Equal Protection Clause comes from the amendment black folks fought for. You're in education. The public finance education in the South was a result of free slaves putting it in the Constitution. So my point there, black folks have always fought for laws mm -hmm. that everybody in America has benefited from. That's right. So make the point to folks who say, but I don't have a place in Black Lives Matter when if you change the laws dealing with the cops, it helps you too. Well, you know, it, it was David Walker and David Walker's appeal who talked about the condition of slavery being uh, the worst. Some say Latino, you say Chicano. Th there's a distinction. The, so Hispanic is a term that was given to us by the government. And I don't originate from Spain. Um, my people who are Mexican are actually a rapage. Um, so we didn't have this love story about, you know, sitting on a panel, we fell in love, I don't know. But, you know, we are a rapage of people. So, however, in 1843, there is a, um, the Treaty of Guadalupe. So there's Chicanos, there's Mexicanos that were born in the Americas, in North America. So my father's 94 years old, 92 years old. My great-grandparents are from Texas. My great-great-grandparents are from Texas. And so when the U.S. ended up taking over Texas and California, my great-grandparents became American citizens. Unfortunately, they were no longer um, be, being able to keep their land. So we are Chicanos because we are landless people, but we are so very political. We are politicized individuals. The reason why there's so many, I think, Chicanos that can relate to the African-American struggle, not saying that we came in slaves, is the fact that, you know, we are also incarcerated at very large rates as African Americans. And so there's a difference between a Mexicano who just came to America and has no connection to the history right. here. So for me, it's about learning about, you know, Book Booker T. Washington, learning about Marcus Garvey, all these individuals. And so what I will say, it's history. It's the lack of education. It's the fact that a lot of individuals don't know the struggles particularly in the Latino community and maybe even the, in, in the white community, there's no connection to history here in the United States. And I want you to make that distinction because the part of this discussion when we talk about race, if you, when you say black, 
We're talking Alabama, Mississippi, right. mm -hmm. Georgia, Arkansas, Texas, Southern states. Carolinas. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. But when we talk about, and I say Hispanic slash Latino for a reason, you're talking about Cuban influence in Florida. You're talking about Dominican influence and Puerto Rican influence uh, in New York, Chicanos in Texas, California. So it's, it's, you're dealing there with nationality mm -hmm. as opposed to just this group that is in America. That changes the, the discussion when, when it comes to what are people fighting for. Go ahead. Right. And so for me, right, I, I always say I want to remove the word Hispanic from, from the census uh, because we don't come from Spain. Latina America, you could, you know, you could swallow a little bit more. I say I'm Latina. You know, if I really want to, you know, have people understand who I am, I say I'm Chicana, and people would be like, are you from Chicago? <laughs> no, I'm not from Chicago. I'm Chicana. And most people actually think Chicana means, oh, you Latino from Chicago. Yes, Whoa. they actually do. Um, but certainly, Seriously. I think there's, there's, there's this disconnection, right? And we got to, again, like, understand who we're dealing with. When I'm talking about you know, black liberation, I'm also looking at the, you know, there are 1.9 Afro-Mexicanos in Mexico, Jeez. right? There's, there's an erasure of blackness in Latin America. There's whitewashing that happens every single day when you turn on the tele telenovela and you mm -hmm. see white people and the only one people that are people of color are the servants mm -hmm. or, or the maids, you know? And so I constantly talk about this in regard to my own people in the sense of, you know, we are taught to glorify whiteness. We are taught at a very young age that being moreno, that being black is, is something uh, not to be proud of. And there's shadism that happens in, in, in Latin America every single day. And so for me, it's about understanding that in my blood, there's African, there's indigenous, and there's European blood. But the European blood isn't because we have, again, we didn't have this love fest. There was wars. There's the conquistadores. Uh, Hernan Cortes that came to Mexico with black slaves, with black people that he then, com you know, made into slaves. And, um, and so for me, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, again, right, it is about power. It's about building collective power. There are leaders all over this country. We don't have just the, 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 the Malcolm X's or the Dr. King's. It's a leaderful movement. But what we want is liberation for our people. And we know that those currently right now that are being oppressed are black people. And once black lives matter, then all lives matter. Dr. Stovall, you earlier talked about the issue of power. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting when I listened to Jesse Williams speak the BT Awards. And when he mentioned freedom, he said freedom is somehow conditional here. She, meaning Sandra Bland, would be alive if she hadn't acted so free. It's interesting to me when I go back Jeff, you and I have had this conversation as well. I go back, when I look at, look at more than three speeches Dr. King gave, mm -hmm. when you look at the, th the three books he actually wrote, numerous speeches, he rarely ever used the word equality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He always spoke of freedom. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Right, so I mean, I think when we talk about freedom and this is an equality, and this is, this is the thing, right? So, I, and excuse this academic thing happening. <laughs> well, you are an academic. Right, 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 so they say, <laughs> right? Existential philosophers say that when any time you have a conversation of equality, the assumption is that things are never equal, right? So that when, and what that means is, when you're saying equal, that's actually a term that is actually assuming something. It is assuming that everyone has the same things to get the same things. So when we talk about an equal society, that's not necessarily equal. It's always who has what and who has the least, right? Freedom is the capacity to self-determine. So when folks are talking about their lives as mattering, they're talking about a call to self-determination, a call that says that my body is not the receptacle for gratuitous punishment, that my body is not only my own, but one that I can claim and one that I actually can move in the world without persecution. So now, this difference between equality is arguing that we all need the same things. That is the worst assumption. 
Freedom says we have to be courageous enough to say not only do we need different things, but we are willing to get those different things on our own terms. And like Asada Shakur says, freedom is something we don't know yet, right? We have a grand idea of, and it is something that we pursue relentlessly. And in the relentless pursuit of that freedom, we understand that our bodies are in front of death all the time when that claim is made. Jeff, you mentioned re this relentlessness. Um, when the remake of Roots was shown on the History Channel, uh, that opening scene of Kunta Kinte going to the plantation, he's going, I only see three of them and a hundred of us. How the hell y'all not taking them over? It was amazing to watch it. He was in this constant, I'm fighting for my freedom. I just spoke at African Arrival Day in Virginia. Where the first slaves came to Port Comfort, now Fort Monroe in Virginia. This was on Saturday, uh, where they recognized that. And we have the 400th, 400th anniversary, or remembrance, in three years. But this constant fight for freedom, that's the piece I don't think a lot of Americans, including black folks, understand that since 1619, we have been in this constant fight. Every step of the way, whether it's siding with the British in the American Revolution, whether it's coming out of the Emancipation Proclamation, this constant fight for freedom. Well, and I think, Roland, even in the examples you gave, um, those are concrete examples of institutional connection. The fight for freedom wasn't always about joining. The fight for freedom was remembering I wasn't created for this. So the songs that I sing, the stories that I tell my children, um, the hope that I give in, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this ecosystem of hopelessness was all about fighting for freedom. And so me helping you remember your name, not the name given to you, but the name that you have. Me helping you remember customs and creating customs so that you are not subjugated to what they tell you you can practice. All of that was about freedom. So, so you didn't have to lead a slave revolt to be fighting for freedom on a daily basis. The fact that you existed waking up realizing this was not what God meant for me to be was a, was a push towards freedom. I think the challenge, Roland, as, as we talk about disruption, and, and we haven't talked about this yet, is we haven't dealt with the reality of the consequences of disruption, not the consequences of perceived disruption, because we got a whole lot of professional disruption <laughs> deceivers. Especially so, so, in this city. Well, no, 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 and, no, not, and, and, and not just I, in this city, I mean, the, 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 there are folks on television, there are folks in organizations that are paid to be perceived as disruptors but don't do any disrupting. Mm -hmm. But people remember and they See, know the story. See, this is all black room. This will be happening right now. Man. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm messing with you. And, and so, so I, I remember, cause, cause, because there's, there is a political side of this, there's a social justice side of this, but there's also a corporate institutional side of yep. this. And so I'm, I'm 43 years old and remember the middle management thing that corporate America did that created this ecosystem of black men that could be in corporate America just high enough not to feel marginalized, but not high enough to control anything. VP of Community like, Affairs. Like, Always. Well, and, and you know, when, when, I, when, I worked, when I worked for the NAACP, we, we had one question we used to ask black executives, is how many white people can you fire? And <laughs> serious. That's real. Because you so. come with your big title and you're talking about all these people you can control. But do you but have you can't fire no white people. There you go. No, I'm not even I talking about you. the money, because you have you have black pools of money. Right? And so you got your PL over your black people stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you can't fire no white people, you really don't have any importance. <laughs> um, don't get scared now, like he gonna come find. <laughs> so like, mm -hmm. the black so, I no, see no, y'all. Me, me and my boys used to joke that you could tell how long somebody's dad had been in corporate America by how little bass they had left in their voice mm. and how little facial hair they Ooh. had. So there was this piece Damn, where it was bass. like, you know, you roll up, you roll up into the company, you're like, what's up, my name is Leroy, uh, and I'm an intern in the mailroom. 
and then, hey, my name is Leroy, and I'm um, an intern in the finance department. Uh, hello. Mm. My name is Leroy, mm. and I'm the CFO of this corporation. And, and, and we laugh, <laughs> but, but I saw the emasculation of black men in corporate America in the name of being safe enough not to make other people uncomfortable about the authentic, uh, the authentic, the authentic, the, 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 the power <laughs> that they brought just by being black men. And, and, and the challenge that I have is even now, we don't talk about the consequence of disruption. So we create the perception of right. disruption to make f people feel like we're really pissed off about stuff that we're not pissed off about because we're not really creating the disruption because even those that, are, that, that want to see the change are fearful of what have happened to the disruptors. So whether it was Nat Turner or whether it was that guy that was a middle manager in this corporation that just got too black that one day, and as a result, he was minimized or removed or fired, or that guy that came every day and had to cut off the goatee because the goatee made somebody else feel uncomfortable, or I dropped that bass in my voice because my boss don't have that in him. Um, and as a result of it, he's, he's intimidated every time I'm my authentic self. We haven't talked about that enough. And so there's a generation that even within Black Lives Matter, and Carmen, right. you tell me if I'm wrong, is operating off of a perception, not everybody, but too many are operating off perceptions of disruption. Yes. They say, how do we create what looks like disruption, but hasn't created legitimate strategy that speaks to the dismantling of institutions that, that is risking more than the perception of disruption is risking? I, I'm going so to, I, 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 go to see the comment, okay. go ahead, but then I'm going to go back to Steve. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I feel as a disruptor, I, I see that the media perceives certain individuals as leaders within the Black Lives Matter movement based on their followers. You don't see these no, individuals no, no, no. in the street. Based upon their social media followers. Social media followers. followers not Twitter actual followers. followers. So these individuals will get paid by corporations to advertise whatever they're advertising on their shirts while they're getting arrested. But I will say, as a disruptor, I, we do, we have several individuals within our team in Justice League you, that have different positions of power. You just threw a gut punch at Dr. Stovall over here. He's like, ooh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> And we will look at how to not only dismantle, but infiltrate the systems yeah. that we're trying to fight up against, right? So if I was a disruptor here in Google, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. <laughs> but one of the things that I was being asked Security. to do. Security. <laughs> I was being asked to do is I was taught to do system accountability from within the system, right? So I learned, I went into the criminal justice probation department to learn the language in order to then come out and give that information back to the community so that then we could then hold, the huh? The spook that sat by the door. Right. And, I was, and, and that's the way in which my elders have taught me to do it, right? And then there's others that will infiltrate but then become that system. Right, and I think that's what you know. We we're trying to figure out. I think sometimes not not only in the Black Lives Matter movement, but in every movement. Absolutely. Right. So it's interesting. While I, while I was listening to, I'm coming to you, Steve. While I was listening to Jeff talk, what and I use this phrase a lot: um, parking lot militants. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the folks. Oh, they talk some shit in the parking lot. E gangsters. Oh man. <laughs> but then when you go back in that building, to Jeff's point, what happened to your base? Wow. And so Steve, while he was talking, he was talking about disrupting. I'm literally sitting here remembering me and you at CNN. <laughs> and remembering cats telling you to cut your hair because it was too wavy. And remembering, uh, remembering uh, every show would get a, pr a readout of voicemails that people left. And nearly every show, when I was on Anderson Cooper's show, Paul Zahn's show, it was, uh, they would come back and say, Roland, can you smile more? Can you smile more? Because I was kicking folks' butt so bad, white folks watching thought I was angry. I'm Bill O'Reilly acting a fool over here, <laughs> and he's passionate. I'm passionate, therefore I'm angry. And I finally said, if I smile anymore, I'm going to be a damn mannequin. 
<laughs> and so when you talk about, to Jeff's point about the flip side of being a disruptor, the reality is you will get to the point where they say, all right, you know what, he too black. So, so there are disruptors and there are commentators. And there are a lot of people who are commentators. They can speak the speak and they can present themselves as if they are so radical and so focused. But ask them ever, what have you disrupted other than a conversation? <laughs> Or a dinner party. <laughs> That's right. Like, did, what really <laughs> have you changed? Did, did you ever email the CEO and push them? There, there's, right. there's yes. that. It, you know, one of the things I say typically to African Americans um, who are on the come up is live modestly. Because too many people <laughs> who I know, they're laughing because they know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Because the day comes when your black ass is about to be asked to leave. <laughs> And if you care too much about this job, then you have to shut your mouth. Yeah. If you think of yourself as somebody who sees this as a job, and the only way that you will live and maintain this lifestyle, you have to be silent. To be a disruptor, you have to accept you will be fired. I, right. You will be asked to leave. It is, it is a condition of the condition of those of us who feel compelled to do something. I get so sick and tired of people. God knows, the, the Twitter sphere has made people think they're somebody. My sons yesterday were taking me through all these different people who are somebody on the internet. And I'm like, damn, for putting <laughs> makeup on? You got 47 million followers because you arch your eyebrows? They beat, though. That's dope. <laughs> they beat, though. So, so, so the point is you that there's, this, there's this entire group. There's this entire group of people thinking that they matter and people who think that they think that they matter because they're somehow connected to them. But at the end of the day, can I run my hands across the building that you've built? Can I, can I go to sit down and talk to the children whose lives you've actually influence. This is not an esoteric policy conversation. At some point, there will be blood. There will be blood. I can tell you, three weeks ago, all four tires of my car were slashed. All four. See, y'all can have that other conversation for other people, but you're not having a conversation about whether or not you're going to have an armed guard travel with you. Because you dare to stand up for children for whom nobody else is willing to stand up for. Everybody else is willing to watch them go into these failed schools and watch them die, incapable of learning, not because they're broken, but because people keep convincing them that there's something wrong with them because they are not white. And so I'm telling you, you ain't disrupting nothing because you changed some conversation on Twitter so that you can find the next white cop who did something that you find disagreeable, or because somebody at some college said something, or always somebody on a college campus hangs something epathy, and everybody trips the hell out. I will say, just to add, I think there's a lane for everybody. There's a lane for everyone. There are those that build the institutions. There's those that work on policy. There are those that are professional protesters. There are those that are organizers. And you know, one of the things that I, I recently, um, a lot of the work that we do is a multi-prong approach. I, I work, again, for the Gathering for Justice and Justice League NYC. And ever since we started working around the um, non-indictment of Officer Daniel Pantaleo and the killing of Eric Garner, you become a target because you're trying to disrupt something. His point with the tires, yeah. You become a target. And, you know, you get death threats. And you don't know, you know, you get told by the mayor, you get a, a personal phone call saying you stop protesting. We put a moratorium on, on protesting, right? And it's, it's what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And so for me, it's not about being silent. It's not about, you talk about the children and the lives of the people you know, who you impact because it's a life or death situation, not only for them, but for yourself, right? Walking into prisons, you, know, you get told before you walk in, and I've been doing this for 20 years, we cannot negotiate your life. Mm -hmm. You gotta understand that you may not come out here, right? And, and what's interesting, you also have trolls, right? How many of y'all got trolls? I got plenty of trolls. I will leave, I'm an executive director of an organization. And because I don't compromise and I don't, I don't, I don't, um, 
I say anything that I want, I don't get certain funding. Mm -hmm. I don't get certain sponsorships. We make miracles happen with rice and beans. It's all, for me, it's about relationships. Me calling Roland Martin to come and host my gala. He's like, all right, sister, I got you. That's what it's about for me. Because you, at the end of the day, I'm not gonna compromise and I'm not gonna sell out the young people that I work with. But I will say it comes with the price. And sometimes that's yep. a deadly price. Jeff. Roland, real quick, because I think I want, I want to build on what Carmen was saying. I think, I think that because some, so often we talk about disruptors through the lens of the most aggressive disruptors, mm -hmm. We negate those that are playing on different parts of the chessboard. That's right. And I, I remember, again, from a corporate side, I was a black student union president, and I'm raising hell on my campus, and we're addressing some fundamental policy issues. And I'm looking at my dad, who's in corporate America, like, man, he a sellout. He just getting paid. <laughs> And he was a VP of student affairs. He was a VP of human resources and head of affirmative action at the University of Cincinnati. And I didn't understand the stakes until the University of Cincinnati got audited for federal affirmative action compliance for hiring. They gave him falsified numbers to sign off on. He filed an obstruction suit against him. He got fired. He was all of a sudden incompetent. And it was then that I said, wait a minute. When my dad was here, more people of color got hired than got hired when he wasn't there. There was better relationships between labor and management when he was there helping negotiate than when he wasn't there. The people that got greater benefits when he was there than when he wasn't there. I was looking through the lens of this really aggressive grassroots mobilization model as the only model. He was walking through the shadows in corporate America ensuring that people's lives were better and he still got caught as a result of when the time came to decide whether or not I am going to continue to play this subversive game or whether I have to stop them in their tracks, he decided to be the ultimate disruptor and he paid the cost. Six years later, his case got kicked back from the U.S. Supreme Court to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals where he had to take a, a, a settlement because the judge hearing the case was an alum of the university and a former associate of the firm representing the university and wouldn't recuse herself. Mm. And so at some point, no matter where you play disruptor, you come up against the realities of the systematic oppression that's mm -hmm. real. And so until, regardless of where we are on that chessboard, whether we're chipping away at it by being inside of these systems, trying to do what we can from the inside, or we're outside trying to push as hard as we can to crack them from the outside, if we're not playing chess, then at the end of the day, we're, we're risking people on the outside that are willing to be aggressive without playing an inside game that's more sophisticated. Uh, I mentioned a couple of books earlier, another book, I, I'm, very, I'm very much a reader. And as you were talking about disruptors, revolutionaries who might look different, I, I immediately came to mind former staff writer, the Chicago Defender, who, who John Sinstack sends to Michigan, take over the Michigan Chronicle. Louis Martin. The book is called Walking with Presidents, Louis Martin and the Rise of Black Political Power by Alex Poinsett. And perfect example, brother working in the Kennedy administration, Johnson administration, some folks said, man, you selling out. And what he's doing is placing folks in different positions, advising the president, literally affecting power. Uh, Bob Brown, a company at Coretta Scott King, to the airport to get out the king's body. Nixon hires him in the administration. He had no designated portfolio, but was doing exactly what you were saying. The folks saying, but how are you working with Nixon? He's saying, but this is what I'm doing inside. And so Dr. Stovall, getting people to understand that this idea of being a revolutionary and a disruptor looks totally different depending upon what the goal is is it important for folks to have the conversations to get us a better sense of a person as an individual to go, oh, now I see what you're about, as opposed to simply making assumptions externally? Right. I mean, and I, and I was real talking to be totally confessional about this. I was the worst in assuming things of folks in terms of their appearance. Right? So in terms of seeing someone, I look, man, that chump, man, I'll rock him in the face. Man, come on, man, he's playing with me. Right? And <laughs> What I really didn't understand was actually folks who look like that actually got me into grad school. Real talk, 
right? And I think the other thing to understand is, and to point that everybody made, if you have made any type of commitment to justice, it is never if they are coming. It is when they are coming, right? So you have to be prepared for when they come. And I learned that from folks who may not have the same type of disposition, but also who are very clear about how they understood the justice condition. Right? Because I think there's many ways for us to approach what the justice condition is. When you were talking, the first person I thought about was Ella Baker. Yep. Right? Ella Baker was very clear. One of the greatest unknown organizers mm -hmm. in history. And what did she say? We are the ones we have been waiting for. Mm -hmm. Right? So what does it mean to actually move in that, in that light? Because the thing is always now, and I love Dead Press used to say this all the time, I don't care what you come to the revolution looking like. Mm -hmm. I just want you to come to the revolution. You could be bespoked up. You could have it fried dyed laid to the side. You could have a bunch of locks. You could have a fro as big as the one me and my pops used to rock. It didn't matter, right? But as long as you are there and as long as you are determining what is that justice condition, because if we are able to agree on that justice condition, we can now figure out the numerous ways to move to make sure that it happens. No, know y'all don't get tired of this, but I have this book too, which is phenomenal. <laughs> Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision by Barbara Ransby. Right up the street. To understand Ella Baker, continuum, progressive politics in the 40s, NAACP field secretary, SCLC creator, SNCC creator, as a continuum there all throughout. Uh, we're gonna go to questions. All right, we got a microphone. Come on up. Yeah, hi. So, Dr. Stovall. You've I, been taking notes, I see. I have been. Yes. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a definition of white supremacy that I've never heard anyone articulate in such an um, important way. And I think it's really interesting. How do we support uh, all of us? How do we support what we're trying to do here without? raising the ire of that particular group of people that are now out there supporting people like Donald Trump. Like, what's the balance of, and I think it goes back to your last point of like, God, I'd like to find a way to do this without alienating and sort of bringing out the worst of the people who feel intimidated now by those of us who want to change. Uh -huh. Well, I think this is a thing, right? Thanks. And thank you for that question. I don't think that should be our job, and I don't think that we can. Right? Because I think the, the, the misconception is that we want to win people over to our side. That's not it. The thing is, we want to recognize what this thing is. Right? We can disagree about it, but I, wanna, I want folks to understand how this affects folks. Right? What does it mean in the day to day? Because this thing, you can argue all day with someone about their particular disposition, but it's really this thing around if you have made a conscious decision to the justice condition, you have already become confrontational before you've even had the conversation, right? I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, it's not about being appeasing to folks. I mean, I think that's the mistake we make, right? It's not about being, being friendly enough. It's like, look, this is happening now. If we're really about what, where we stand on things, and this is another thing, once people reveal themselves, now you know how to move, right? Cause so once, so once right. that person shows up, you say, right. oh, okay, that, that, that's that <laughs> one. I need to go elsewhere. Here's, here's the work, because what we want to do in this larger justice condition, we want those folks to show their ugly head. Now we know what we're dealing with, right? It's harder when some, that person smiles and now does the little passive aggressive thing, and now the door's closing and they got two AK-47s waiting for you, right? So mm -hmm. that, that thing, so in Chicago, we used to crack this joke. When you go to a meeting anybody in the, with anybody in the city of Chicago, the mayor's office or whoever, you have to understand that there's a 38 on the table. As soon as you turn your back, someone's brains is blown out. Walk backwards, right? Once you leave the table, right? And that sounds extreme, but this thing around, when we get caught into that idea around conversion, we obfuscate what we're trying to do. Right, was, is to identify how this affects folks and then what this justice condition is and now how we are committed to pursue it. Because I believe that all those folks will now start to, as we always like to use this term, self-select and go elsewhere. We also make the mistake, I think, of trying 
to make everybody comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> when the reality is, this, this, ain't is, this is all uncomfortable. At its, at its core, it's disruptive. Right. I mean, the expectation right. is that the only way we will truly become the country who we set out to be or the person that you set to be is to change your habits. The only way you're going to lose weight is to change the way you eat, increase your cardio, whatever it is. You, change is by design disruptive. Well, the first of all, you got to acknowledge that you want to change. Well, there's that. But once you've done that, once you've called for a change, you have to do so. For instance, in hiring, you have to look beyond the circumstances that you typically look beyond. You have to look for different skill sets. You have to be willing to open your mind and heart to the fact that somebody may look at the problem differently. And so there may not be an answer. There may be multiple answers. And as a result of which, you become disruptive to the hiring practice, thereby creating an entirely new conversation within your organization. And so it's not just about one of the problems I have, for instance, with the Democratic Party is this notion of diversity. Yeah, the colors were different. But they all got up there and said some version of the same thing. And so I didn't really see diversity. I saw different colored people and some different genders, of course. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there wasn't true diversity. And so for in, order, in order for us to have the conversation around disruption, we have to be comfortable with the idea that this disruption is going to be, at its core, uncomfortable for a spell. It's funny you said that, because Oprah Winfrey's on the cover of The Hollywood Reporter with Ava DuVernay this week. Uh, and Oprah says she, is, she has removed diversity from her vocabulary. She said, because Ava has taught her, no, forget diversity. You want inclusion. You want to be at the table. She said, not just diverse, it's about inclusion. And at the, table, at the table in a position where your voice matters as much as anyone else's, there are times in which I've been part of movements where they call me after a decision has been made that we're having a march. And I'm like, what the hell? If I'm part of this, right. shouldn't I have been communicated with when you were considering the action? Shouldn't my opinion have mattered as much? See, inclusion, in that sense, is when my voice matters as much as anyone else's in the conversation. And until such time as my voice is seen, you, it's part, at the start of this, I acknowledge that we don't have a lot of women up here. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important that it be clear that I recognize that. That I'm not OK with the fact that, from a parity perspective, I'm calling and saying what we need to do as people. And I'm calling upon other people, but on the same token, acknowledging, not acknowledging my own conversation that we, in, in, at this stage, if nothing else, in the diversity of thought, would have a diversity agenda here. Let's go to questions. Uh, of course, uh, folks who are watching, you can also ask questions. Uh, so it's Anna Turner. How can corporations best participate in racial justice without undermining existing social movements? Who wants the, that? There is a great science educator by the name of Yomo Mutegi who's at the University of uh, Indiana, Indianapolis. You're going to dispel that one later. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and Yomo always makes this point. He says, here's what, here's what you can do. He says, first, you can apologize. Second, do not start to join or make claims about a commitment to anything that you are not willing to support. Third. Get out of the way, right? So it's this, always these things around. Because a lot of times, and this is a thing in education, we often talk about this. The word help is temporary, right? We're talking about solidarity, which is a very different thing. It is a more contested word. It means something different. It means that you have agreed to support something that will challenge you in the support of it. So now that I think that becomes important because I, I hate it when I hear folks say, I just want to help. We don't need that, right? I, I want to be clear about that because all that is is temporary and all that is is a feel good thing. What we want folks to do is to be able to challenge their existence in this. We got to ask a different set of questions because I might even uh, depart in a different space because when we look at the language of this country, we see something different not just in the Emancipation Proclamation, not just in the Constitution. We need to read stuff like the Federalist Papers, right? right? Particularly like Federalist Papers, as Jared Ball always talks about, Federalist Papers 210 and 22, that talks about the United States as being a country in and of its space being preserved for white men, right? 
So now when we, we begin to ask those questions, it's not about us helping, it's how are we willing to challenge ourselves in a very particular way and then get out of the way to let folks who have committed to do this work do this work. And first, about what you're laying out, also about understanding that you're understanding how the nation was constructed, which means that you're understanding the DNA of America. So when you actually go through all of that, you can actually tie the Federalist Papers to 2016. I mean, so when, uh, I just got an email, um, uh, and he, he, he said it on Saturday when I was with the Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, uh, when he restored the voting rights of 13,000 formerly incarcerated. What folks don't realize is the law that prevented them from voting was literally based upon a legislator in 1902 who said, this is to keep the darkies from voting. And he said, I'm restoring these rights because the law was based on a racist premise. But folks in 2016 were still fighting to uphold that law, but had no idea what they claimed of the history. Another Carmen. Book, There's also um, what's called Solidarity Summit. There's about 40 of us that travel across the country uh, with OSI, Open Society Institute, and um, the Ford Foundation. And we actually do some really deep digging around our personal cultures and do cultural exchanges. And I think that's also important to do. And when you look at, you know, one of the things that I, I know in any institution is usually I'm the only Latina, I'm the, I'm the only woman, or I'm younger than everybody <laughs> by 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so I will say that one of the things that I've learned is that people will say, well, it's because people of color aren't qualified, mm -hmm. right? We don't have qualified uh, people so that we could hire them to do this work. And I think that needs to shift. You were talking about not just diversity in color, but also diversity in, in age, diversity in, in gender, in, in different levels. Um, but it's not just about being at the table. It's the fact that if when you're creating something, bring those that are impacted or those that you're actually looking to serve to actually be a part of that conversation like you were saying. But I know for me, one of the things I constantly look at is am I taking up too much space? especially being a Latina in a Black Lives Matter movement or being a older person working with youth, right? Am I taking up too much space? Um, and also, am I giving individuals the opportunity and also supporting and cultivating their leadership, right? And it's also about relationship building. It's not about like, oh, you know what? You know, I don't have black friends, so now I'm gonna go make some black friends. And, and ask them like every race question, it's about, you know what, like I really wanna be intentional about who I'm talking to and who I'm building relationships with. And I, yeah, no. go ahead. Um, but I just kinda wanted to offer that just because I also know there are white people that do this work around Black Lives Matter and there are white allies and sometimes they take up a lot of space. You know, they're the ones that are like showing up to the protest or they're the ones that are like doing the chants. And sometimes you got to remind them of their, of their space. And I sometimes don't want to remind all white people of where they need to be. Um, but I will say is that, you know, they'll be out there fighting for the liberation of black people. But when you go to their dinner table, ain't nobody black. So I just kind of want to point that out. Yeah, r r real quick, Roland, because I think that there are a couple of things. One is I think companies have the ability to do two really easy things, well, not easy, but pragmatic things. One is create ecosystems of conversation that traditionally didn't happen before. And so how do you create ecosystems versus echo chambers? So often within institutions, people are just shouting at each other. Sometimes they're shouting at each other in silence. So when two black men get shot by police and police officers get shot, people may not be shouting at each other, but they shouting at each other. So I know what side you on, and we walking by <laughs> each other in the hallway at work, and we ain't saying nothing, but I know you support them cops, or I know you support them black folks. And we're shouting at each other, but nobody's listening. And so how can you be courageous enough as a corporation to create ecosystems where it's not about whether it's blue lives or black lives, it's how do we create ecosystems in our firms that create space to have different difficult dialogue that doesn't become judgmental or combative um, but it, and it isn't about walking away with agreement. 
-hmm. Because I think so often these conversations right. about do we walk away agreeing right. versus do we walk away better understanding. Right. The second thing is how do we support the individual passions of our employees without repercussion? Mm -hmm. And so as long as I'm engaged in something that's not breaking the law, um, can my company support me doing that? Third, how do we have better conversations about the ecosystem of impact? Because to Carmen's point, it's not necessarily about Google showing up with Google shirts at the Black Lives Matter rally. It's about where is there an economic impact of a certain demographic of customers of our corporations, and how do we engage them in conversation or support in ways that are beyond showing up at a rally? Where's the economic impact? And I think in the movement, we don't always have economic impact-based conversations. Yep. So where is the social, where's the social venture impact opportunities for companies to say, wait a minute, I'm not gonna get, be on the front line of this movement, but I am gonna support the development of new schools that impact this community in a way that reduce violence because more opportunity, less violence. Oh. Or I am gonna have a conversation where why can't companies begin to, see, I'm confused about why in Chicago there has not been a, a public meeting of corporations about what's the economic impact of violence to the city of Chicago. Where companies begin to say, wait a minute, we have a responsibility to the development of infrastructure and support <laughs> in a city. I know I'm reaching, but what I'm saying is <laughs> she, she asked for what were the potential yes, solutions yes. of ways they can participate in, in racial justice without undermining the existing social movement. Play your role. Yeah. And your role is in the impact of the economy. And so how do you do right. that by having conversations with those that are impacted by the economic impact of violence in Chicago or lack of education in Baltimore? Um, but, but I don't see those companies feeling like they're invited right. or feeling the, the, the responsibility to, to lead those discussions to talk about a whole other set of ecosystem that, cre that impacts racial and social justice without getting in the way of those on the ground. My answer to this question is very quick. Before you decide to get involved in some external movement, look inside your company first. That's right. Because it's just like my biggest criticism of mainstream media, mainstream media can't call out Republican Party when it comes to outreach of black folks when they don't outreach to black folks. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for you to say, oh, no, 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 we support that. But then when you look inward, you go, oh, wait a minute. So when Reverend Jackson targeted Silicon Valley, he said, you can't have officials in Silicon Valley writing checks to supporting organizations, to your point, wearing the shirts, but employing less than 1% of certain groups, and not just, in, not just in science and technology, when the reality is 60% of all Silicon Valley jobs don't even involve science and technology. It's your, account, your accounting firms, law firms, advertising firms, marketing firms. So any company, look at yourself first before you go outside, because you might get called out. Question here, question here, then I'm going to another question from an external audience. Go. Thank you for coming. Um, one of the things that I heard that profoundly affected me from Tim Wise was that white privilege is not about guilt, that white privilege is about responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think it's tangentially related to what you were just talking about, that responsibility that we have. I'd love to hear your thoughts about guilt versus responsibility and that notion of trying to be comfortable and it's not possible really to be comfortable that we really need to be uncomfortable to be able to be responsible. And that's not for our own personal actions, but for what has happened in the country and around the world. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Need two folks, tight answers before we go to the next question. Super so. quick. One of the ways to actually engage that, that question is what Brother Martin first said. The conversation is first with other white folks, right? C clearly, right? This thing around when you are engaging with other white folks about what this actually means, then you get another set of conversations. So in addition to Tim Wise, check out a guy named Paul Gorski, right? He's committed to doing this work. And then when he, what he talks about is that type of conversation is the in-house conversation that other folks might not be privy to, but now will allow you to think about what, how you move and what you do moving forward. Because a lot of times it's not about feeling uh, going into the guilt mode around making folks feel halfway decent that you now recognize what's happened to them. Mm -mm. It's really around what do we say to each other recognizing this thing to be true. Another person you mentioned, uh, say the name again. Paul Gorski. Uh, another person you should YouTube uh, is I'm trying to pull up her name. Jane Elliott. Yes. 
Yes. She did this <laughs> blue eye experiment on the Oprah show that totally, if you go look at her videos, and she goes right to the heart of this issue. And before she asks this question of an all white audience, how many of you would trade places with a rich black person? And nobody raised their hand. She said, that's white privilege right there. And she said, and y'all ain't rich. <laughs> question. Um, thank you guys for coming. I think this is really important. Um, one of the biggest questions that I have is what can I do? What should I do that demonstrates solidarity, not help, that is in the right lane, that acknowledges that I am a white person, but I still want to help with this? I think it, thank you for your question, and, and I was waiting for that question. Um, <clears throat> I think that you have to first do an assessment of your own talents and interests. As uh, Brother Johnson said a little earlier, he talked about people working in different spaces and the respect that we have to have for that. And so whatever it is that you think you could have an impact on, using your time and talents mm -hmm. to make that happen. So for instance, if you feel like your work was best with women, because you're a woman, and it, for me it would be about finding an organization that looked to improve the lives of women, if it was about writing about women and you'd use your, your written word to push that, that forward. I think any person that tells everyone that they should do something in particular is a person who is not learned and not compassionate and doesn't understand that there's a beauty in, in the intricacy of, of each one of our gifts. And so I think what we're, we're tasked with is engaging your heart such that your mind will follow and that you will use your mind to think of the things that you could do. One of the things I often think that we all have an obligation to do is to involve ourselves in what I refer to as micro-political actions, meaning individual tasks that will somehow improve the, the lot of those people around you. And that may be something as simple as uh, volunteering on a, on a school board or, or working, and I'm, again, I'm from MySpace, or working with children, to recognizing that at your company there may be an affinity group, an African-American group, or a Latino group, or a gay, or straight, or alliance group, whatever the case may be, within the context of your company, wherever you feel, you can make the greatest impact using your time and talents mm -hmm. to do something. Other people are not going to get caught up in, let's say, something that is political on a big P political. Whereas some people may, I don't want you to think that because you did something at Google that that would somehow be less than important. I would suggest to you that there's a lot that you can do. It starts with you taking an inventory, right. doing an audit of your time, talents, and desires and with all due haste, not waiting another day. Because I'll say this final thing. The fact that you guys are here is dope. And I say that sincerely because I'm sure that they're going to pay you no matter where you are in the building. <laughs> but based upon the food that was coming out of that sick cafeteria that you seem to have, y'all could have spent a little more time there. The fact that you're here le leads me to believe that you want to do something. You want to be inspired. You want to find the space in which you fit in. And the challenge that I know that I have at times is I want to answer your question like in the way that I think you want to answer, like a specific, you should tomorrow morning go That's here. Right. <laughs> but I don't know the answer to that. But I do know tonight on your ride home, That's right you can come up with a solution because that thing that's been pinging inside your heart yeah. that you should do, not should anymore. It's must. Jeff? R real quick, I, the other thing I would say is listen. Because uh, I think a lot of us in our desire to do good uh, bring too many assumptions mm -hmm. right. to that process. Yep. Uh, never forget taking a bunch of college students to New Orleans right after Katrina. And, and they were incredibly well-meaning, but unbelievably arrogant, mm. uh, that they thought they were saving somebody mm -hmm. on their spring break. Mm. Um, and, and we had to tell them before they engaged, the most important thing you can do tomorrow is listen to what the people tell you to do, <laughs> because they already have the answers. And if you are going to be in solidarity with them, it's not about you coming in with your brilliance to tell them what they need. It's your humility coupled with your brilliance that can be directed in the right way. When we mentioned the, El, uh, the Barbara Ranson book on Ella Baker, that was the one thing she told everyone at the NAACP, SCLC, and SNCC. She said, when you go to Alabama, you go to those sharecroppers, first of all, take off your damn college clothes 
and put an overall on. And she said, and listen to them. Forget the fact that some of them have a third and fourth grade education. She said, let them tell you what they want to do and then say, I'm here to help you achieve that. So that was one of her biggest pieces right there. Listen to what they want to hear. Dor, you got something for me? All right, I'm going to go to a question here. Let's go. Hey, how you doing? Thank you so much for coming. Uh, you know, being nine years here at Google, uh, having something like this occur is, is really, really awesome. Uh, you know, we, a lot of us talk about it on the sidelines, but it's great to have a, a premier event here. And thank you for hosting. And Glad to be others, here. Compañera, for being here. Um, I, I want to provide two things, and maybe more for the fellow Googlers. Uh, one, one thing you can do is definitely like hook up with some of the ERGs. Uh, the ERGs are all open. Uh, okay, it's, I ain't from here. What the hell is the ERG? <laughs> Employee Resource Groups. So, right. Hola for Latinos, BGN. It's not exclusive to just Latinos or just Blacks. Or the Diversity Book Club is reading uh, the Between the World and Me. We're going to meet on that next week. Uh, women at, Gaglers, etc. More than just going to the Pride Party, actually talking uh, about the issues, right? Uh, and then sometimes I'm known to be a little disruptive. So, what I would like to challenge to my fellow Googlers and Googlers leadership is. You know, we have cases where, you know, the mayor of Chicago has graced our stage, where Kissinger has graced our stage in Mountain View, et cetera, right? But let's also bring over the other side of things, right? Let's bring the CTU leadership to discuss why they think they might have to go on strike in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. because they value the, how they interpret, maybe we don't all agree, what they value in terms of uh, what families and children in Chicago need. And how many of us live in Chicago? and feel so mixed about the schools, right? And how they're addressing it, et cetera, right? So let's hear some of those viewpoints instead of just always having the mayor and everyone we have to have great relationships with, but we have some other viewpoints. So let's challenge ourselves to hear some of those, Yep. right? Uh, same thing on other issues. Uh, uh, there's gay groups, there's women's groups, et cetera, groups that all have great speakers, great uh, partnerships, and let's put them out there, and not just the ones that, not just the mayor or the political leadership, which might all kind of reflect one way. Let's hear out some of the other viewpoints. But also, I will say this here, challenge groups about what happens internally. Um, when I, the reason I say that, uh, I, um, we had, three months ago, Michael Sam gave an interview with a British magazine, and he said he faced more res racism from white LGBTers than he did black homophobia. Got virtually no coverage. Mm. I had a whole panel of African Americans who were gay and lesbian when we talked about that very issue. And I posed the question, how could you have an equality movement where you practice inequality? And I guarantee you, had Michael Sam said he faced a plethora of black homophobia mm -hmm. and love from white LGBT, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC, CBS, NBC would have all had panels, think pieces, the New York Times on black homophobia. And again, that's one of those, again, discussions one can have uh, 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 among groups challenging. Hey, the issue of colorism also with African Americans, another major issue. Go ahead. Before you go forward, it, you know, I was laughing to myself as the as, uh, gentleman was talking about having different groups here. One of the things I would encourage you also is have the other side. If y'all gonna have CTU here, I'm not saying you call me. Steve although, saying call Steve. Although, although I would come back in an ambulance. Um, Steve would drive here. <laughs> damn right, he would drive. But uh, for real. So, <laughs> whew. Um, but uh, the, the important point is to have a, a valid and, and meaningful counterpoint to some of those conversations because one yep. of the things that happens sometimes is if you're not familiar with the topic, the person who's presenting the topic, whose job it is to present the topic, can always make it seem like it makes more sense. I want to use that just if, if really quick Great for uh, really quick. So, for instance, let's say you were to bring in the conversation around the Chicago Teachers Union saying they're going to strike again. Um, I would suggest you also bring in some parents, right. some other individuals who who are going to be hurt badly when such a decision is made, and 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 on through, not just the usual suspects, but individuals who who are impacted by whatever the conversation is, so that what you end up doing is creating a robust conversation from which individuals who are being introduced to the topic for the first time could actually have the opportunity to hear, wait a minute, I never really thought of it that way, regardless of what the topic is. Right. You know, you, you see a diversity of thought up here 
you know, we haven't spent enough time that you would see the, the, the breadth of the diversity, but I think you've heard it in just some of the slight conversation that you heard, that there's a diversity of thought here. And, and, and I don't know the, uh, the others as well as I know Jeff and, and Roland. If the three of us were in a room, you'd hear the diversity really quickly. And be uh, real loud. And, and, right. <laughs> From them two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like like you have never got loud. Okay, yeah, all right. What you uh, hear from Roland would be loudness I, of, of I this, also uh, want to add, um, I really love the panel conversation and, and having a host, but there's a model called the World Cafe mm. where you actually do panel conversations and then you break out into smaller conversations and then bring it back to the mm -hmm. room. Yeah. And when I talk about relationship building, you know, one of the things, you know, you said it perfectly. I always tell people, don't go start other organizations. You know, tap into what you do really well and offer that to an organization that's around you. Because you could teach somebody a discipline, you can't teach them to have heart. And you want people who have heart to come and, and volunteer for you or offer you. But also you could donate to organizations keeping it a buck. Just, you know, there are organizations that also need financial resources, but like I said, you know, I think it's really important to also build relationships among yourselves um, because you guys all have to work with one another. I got uh, less than two minutes question right here. Go right ahead. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Perry, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an opportunity because my question was for you. Um, a lot of what our Chicago office does the most of is around education um, out in the community. So what are some of the things that you see specifically um, within the institutions, what are the main changes you would like to see that would have the a biggest impact quickly? Thank you. The most yeah. important thing for me is school choice. Uh, allow the parents to make those micro-political decisions. This is still a democracy. A parent should not be forced to send their child to a school in which the people who work in it would never send their children to. To start there. The second thing is recognize that the conversation around education in the United States of America is driven by employment, not education. That's why these essentially are boards of employment, not boards of education. The system is designed to ensure that individuals who stay, who work in it, stay employed. There's a shift in the way, the paradigm of professionalism. Unlike generations from the past where this, genera this generation of, of professionals do not necessarily value job security, you, you, you value the product. And that doesn't happen in the traditional public education system at the level it should. In fact, it's longevity that, that gets you the greatest reward as opposed to productivity. And so you have to take the same model that you use here that is in fact working, like not just here but Uber and, and, and uh, uh, Airbnb, where you're seeing a product that's meaningful. So you as consumers, whether or not you have children in the system, you are in fact consumers because at the end of the day, to Brother Jeff's point, you're going to either employ or not employ Chicago Public Schools graduates. So there needs to be a push from organizations such as this to push for the very things that you want for your own children were you to have them if you have them. And that is to have access to a quality education. I ask you to ask for nothing more and nothing less. To, uh, to what, what Brother Suave was saying, that sometimes the conversation about equity and freedom means that some people need a little bit more in order to get equal because for so long they have not gotten that. So for me, the bottom line is, if this school is so good, then no child should ever have to be forced to attend it. They will attend it because they wish to. School choice provides families with the same opportunity that, that has been provided to, to wealthy and white Americans forever because for the first time in American history, we're actually having a conversation around poor people who are saying, where are you sending your child to school this year? That was a conversation that for generations mm -hmm. was confined only to the well-to-do. So I'm saying, with all due haste, Push as hard as you can for school choice, school choice, school choice, because that is the only strategy that will provide for access to a quality education within the lifetime of the children who are, in fact, in school. I will give you another book. <laughs> the education, th th this is probably one of the most important books I have ever read you will be blown away by the first 50 pages. Uh, the Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935 by James D. Anderson, professor right here uh, in Illinois, University of Illinois. It took him 10 years to do that book. Uh, and he lays out that, not only that, the first collective bargaining was freed slaves, <laughs> where after slavery, uh, plantation owners wanted them to work the land, and they said, we will only agree to work the land if you build a school on the grounds. That was collective bargaining. I mean, but is it, go ahead, Doc. Go. There's just something real quick around this thing around, and we made a part 
on this moment, but I want us to be clear about when we talk about education, there is an assumption that is very dangerous. One of the assumptions that is very dangerous is that education works like you all do in businesses. And this is why it's dangerous. Models of efficiency tell us that we can do a lot of things very well and sanguine. We don't learn like that, right? So education can be effective, but it's not always efficient in the general sense of efficiency. And I think that's a, there's a common assumption, a misconception that those things, if something is working smoothly, that it's working. That is not the case, right? <laughs> we have to have spaces that support young folks in the ways in which they learn, right? Because this is, this is, a, big, this is a big contention. Because a lot of times folks can drop in communities and say, here's this new thing. And you've had a ton of shit. And here's this new thing. But all it really is, is new, right? They haven't talked about what this thing is actually putting forward. So a lot of times you get these situations where families, their desperation is played on in opposed to saying, here's what we're going to do in partnership with you in opposed to, you've had shit, here's this new thing, I know it's least, not that thing that you've had. And I think that thing becomes critically important when we talk about educational spaces because that piece around being effective based on the community's needs is critical. Anything else is a projection of the larger colonial project. I think one of the things also to keep in mind as we have that conversation is that the reason why parents are running screaming from these schools is because in many cases they went to those schools as well and their grandparents went to those schools and they were underserved by them. And so no one should consider opening anything, whether it be uh, an, any type of organization in the community that doesn't take into consideration the integrity of the community. On the same token, no one should also stop the parents from doing what they must do to go to the best schools they can. There are children who have attended my schools who I know for a fact do not live in the catchment areas. I know it. I know they're using somebody else's address, and I will never tell. It is not going to happen. Because I'd rather them break a law that is unjust than to do something as unjust as to, put, to abide by the law. We have a set of laws that have been put in place that, that, is, that started with the, uh, with the very segregation of neighborhoods, the creation of ghettos, that have fostered the failures of, of millions, literally millions of children, millions and who've done nothing wrong other than to be born in the wrong zip code. And so what we hear too often in the conversation around education is about employment. We do not hear about the children. And you'll hear, you'll hear diversionary tactics about testing and, 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 and privatization and other notions that somehow are meant to take your eye off the ball. But at the end of the day, if you are so blessed to be a parent, you will pray the same prayer over your children that every single person has prayed regardless of religion or type, that your child does better than you. And one of the most important things that you will do is to decide on the school that they will attend. And we have seen these schools fail. Great, fantastic, amazing teachers in some of them, fantastic uh, principals in some of them. But for whatever the case may be, they're not winning. And I, for one, would never want to be even slightly responsible for keeping in place any policies that will send one child one day to a failed school. I'll say this final point. One of the hardest things to see, and anybody up here who's ever seen this is, is know, knows this, is to see a child who's given up on school. The dead stare that comes over the face of a seventh grader who recognizes that there's just no hope for her or him in this institution. And that they are, have, in fact, essentially been broken intentionally broken, so much so that their self-esteem is shot, versus the time when you see the child who's four or five years old who's super duper excited about school, just can't wait to come to school and learn. Why is it that we would ever keep in place an institution that has promised to destroy the children most in need, black, Latino, poor, most specifically African-American boys, why would we ever send another human being to that and call ourselves a humane society? 
It's not about resources. It's not about how much a school costs because we spend the most amount of resources locking those very same little boys up. The issue is about the quality of the institution, which starts with a respect for the community, no doubt, but also the anticipation that every single child is in that building is freaking amazing, and they're going to do everything they can to make that possible. I just I'm, wanted that, to add a cost analysis to what he was saying in regards to This is going to be your final comment. Yes, yeah, sorry. It cost $125,000 in New York State to lock a young person up per year versus $10,000 from K to 12 to educate them. So I just wanted to, because what he's talking about is providing educational opportunities for young people so that they could thrive and not end up in the system that I'm working in and seeing those young people at my table. And so we see young people as young as 10 years old incarcerated uh, in a detention center and the clothes doesn't even fit them and it's because they don't have anything else. They don't have hope anymore. So. And let us not forget the rising number of young girls of color who are in those institutions. Frightening. Yeah. It's critical because that population has actually increased 300% since 1970. And it's not slowing down at 500. all. 500. Right? Right, so now, so we, mm -hmm. we, we have to put that, put that on the table. Mm -hmm. That's your final comment? Yes, sir. Jeff Johnson, <laughs> you can uh, out. Great book, uh, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Oh, my uh, awesome. uh, Oh, my God. Yeah. Reginald Lewis. By Reginald F. Lewis, uh, first person to negotiate a billion dollar deal in corporate America, uh, and speaks a, a lot about what, what we've been talking about today. Um, second of all, I, I, I don't want to leave without there's a question up here that says, is it possible that women are underrepresented here because the language of disruption and maybe the movement isn't inclusive? There was a discussion about mid-level, uh, mid-tier corporate jobs for black men being emasculating, but where do black women fit into that conversation? Simple answer is yes. Um, and I think Carmen and others, um, many in this room have been fighting uh, feverishly to make sure that we challenge I think some of the sexism and misogyny that existed within civil rights and the black power movements from a people of color perspective, but broadly as it relates to movements for social change. Um, and we're constantly challenging it. Um, and even us bringing it up in the beginning saying, why is there only one sister uh, on the panel is part of it. But the other piece is how are we building pipelines of leadership um, and voices of sisters, especially within the movement, where we don't immediately go to the brother who's on TV the most uh, versus the sister who's doing the better work. So I, I think that's part of it. Last but not least, I think that one of the biggest challenges with our discussions around diversity and inclusion from a corporate perspective is even saying inclusion is the goal isn't big enough. The goal is community. Because if you have diversity and inclusion, that just means that you're diverse enough to check off boxes and inclusionary enough to invite people to the table but not deliberate enough to make sure that those people at the table feel like they're represented in all facets of the DNA of the institutions that we're a part of. And only then do we really have community. A couple of points. You don't have to be of the same tribe to help elevate somebody else. <laughs> um, Carmen knows this because I've actually told her and Linda and Tamika, that uh, I will use my platform to elevate y'all. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm against some of the other people, uh, but I'm in control of my stuff. And I get to pick who I want to elevate, and I'm recognizing, to Jeff's point, who's actually doing the work. Some folks, they are hype. Some folks actually do the work. Uh, and so that's important, because even in corporate America, you will talk to some African Americans, Latinos, uh, Asians and will tell you it was somebody white who was their best benefactor, who supported them just because. You will find somebody uh, black who say it was another sister uh, and it was a brother who was being elevated. And so uh, we look at the individual and begin to say, you know, I'm going to invest in you because I think you can do something. The last point is this here. Y'all are a part of a company, folks in the room and also those who are watching, that have been revolutionaries that have been disruptors, uh, that have literally changed multiple industries uh, over the last 10 years. 
And the thing that I think we have to think when we look at it, well, what can we do? Because people always say, what can we do? And I always use this example. There literally are more people sitting in this room right now than there were sitting in a church basement in Montgomery in 1955. The Montgomery bus boycott, we know historically, was 381 days. It was never designed to be a 381-day boycott. It was actually a one-day boycott. And 50,000 black folks didn't get on the bus. And they went, well, hell, we go for two. <laughs> then three. It actually, if you look at the original list of demands, originally they didn't even call for an end to segregated busing. They just asked for better respect to black bus, dri bus riders. Can you hire a few more black bus drivers? Those were initial demands. Out of Montgomery led the lawsuit, Supreme Court ruling. Then they said, well, what else? Then they went Albany, Georgia. Then they went Selman, Birmingham. And then they went to cities all across the South, four college students, freshmen. Didn't ask anybody's permission, North Carolina a and They just chose to say, we're going to go integrate this lunch counter. That led to a spread like wildfire all across the South. Imagining, imagine somebody sending a tweet, and then all of a sudden, it literally goes across. That's what that was. The point I'm making is this here. That got us the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Fair Housing Act of 68. That got us Arthur Fletcher putting affirmative action in place when Nixon became president uh, in 1969. The point there is a handful of people literally changed the world. If you go to, if you go to Serbia, there's an MLK Drive. There's one in India. Lech Walesa, the Solidarity Movement in Poland in the 1980s, they were singing, We Shall Overcome. In Eastern Europe, they were singing, lift every voice and sing. The Arab Spring, they were wearing signs, I am a man, which were the exact same signs black men were wearing in Memphis in 1968. Salutation. So the point there is a handful of people in a church basement literally has impacted the world. And so you might not think it, but if you look around in this room, you actually have the capacity based upon collective action, based upon commitment, based upon vision, based upon being a disruptor, to change the world just with the people sitting in this room. To Steve's point, what are you prepared to do when you leave this room? So Dr. Steve Perry, Carmen Perez, Jeff Johnson, Dr. Stovall, Roland Martin. Round of applause, please. Oh.